Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just really so happy to be here, and I'm glad to join us for another update as well. Welcome to our town hall meeting, and thank you to Eudora Mulbauer, our ASL interpreter, for supporting today's event. Today, I'm joined by Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement, Wyatt Jesse, Director of Student Support Services, Carrie Nicholson, and Director of Enrollment and Planning Services, Ashley Davies, to share updates and to answer questions around planning for our return to in-person instruction and the intent to return survey shared with families earlier this month. I know many of our families and many of our staff are anxious to know more details around our plans for a return to school buildings on March 1st for pre-K, first grade, um, and kindergarten students, and students being served in special education intensive service pathways. We want to be sure that we are communicating in as many ways as possible so that everyone stays updated. The family and staff survey responses are a key step to finalizing many of our plans. And so far, over 70% of families who received the intent to return survey have responded. School principals and staff are now working to reach out directly to each and every family who did not respond. Our aim is to get 100% of families accounted for. Parallel to the family survey, our human resources team sent the survey to school-based staff who may be serving pre-K to first grade students or students served in special education pathways. Over 80% of staff who received the survey have responded. This will allow us to begin to match staff and students, making sure that we have a one to 15 or less ratio in our classrooms. That information is also key to creating new school level master schedules, lifting up new bus routes, creating in-person lunch services, and so much more. And while continuing to maintain regular operations for remote learning, special education, childcare, and serving 30,000 meals a day. As these details are finalized, we are committed to communicating transparently and often. We're hosting more virtual town halls like these to answer your questions and to provide updates. Our public affairs team will be sharing updates directly to families and staff of students identified for in-person instruction every other week, in addition to our weekly School Beat newsletter to all families. Our School Beat newsletter goes out to over 100,000 people each week. If you do not currently receive this method of communication and you'd like to receive it, you can sign up on our website and we'll provide that link in the chat. I encourage you to look at our return to in-person FAQ on our website that is regularly updated with questions from our community and we'll add those links as well to the chat. We've also launched a bargaining updates web page for families and staff as we negotiate with our um, labor partner Seattle Education Association. SEA and SPS will begin our negotiations on January 25th. If there are any changes in planning due to negotiations, we will communicate final decisions to families and staff no later than February 22nd. I recognize that this requires a lot of patience and understanding from our families. This pandemic has asked all of us to live with more uncertainty and unknowns than we ever have before. As guidance from the state and public health officials has changed, we have adjusted. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've been hosting meal sites, serving thousands of meals a day. We've been hosting childcare in over 40 of our schools. Our strong health protocols have protected staff and students. And while there have been COVID cases, we have not had widespread transmission. Cases have been minimal and they've been mitigated. This is why we believe that we can bring back more students. And with the vaccine on the horizon, it gives us even more hope. We will continue to listen and to respond to what our community needs and will continue to advocate right alongside you. That includes making January vaccines for educators and all school-based staff that will be supporting the increase in in-person learning a priority. Earlier this month, I asked Governor Inslee and our state public health officials to prioritize vaccinations for public educators and our critical support staff to send a strong message of the state's commitment to public education and our educators. I'm happy to share that yesterday, 
the Department of Health issued a revised vaccine distribution schedule. This means that all school employees are eligible in phase 1B or earlier. I'm also super excited to announce that we are partnering with Swedish Medical Group and Seattle University to provide access for SPS employees to the vaccine following this new schedule and phased approach. We'll be sharing more about that partnership with staff and families in the coming days. Thank you to Swedish Medical Group and to Seattle University for this critical partnership and for support of our staff and community. Before I pass it over to Chief Jesse and Directors Nicholson and Davies, I want to answer a few of the questions remaining from last week's town hall. First, there was a question about will there be funding for full-time nurses? The answer sadly is no. The state has not allocated additional funds for full-time nurses at each site. We have put into place strong safety protocols, including daily health screenings, masks, physical distancing, cleaning, et cetera, to limit the spread of COVID-19, and it's worked so far. What's the plan if there is a positive case or cases of COVID-19? We're working to create classroom settings that limit transmission as much as possible. If a positive case does occur in a school, we will determine the range of potential contact and if a building or classroom closure is necessary. These processes have been in place since the spring at our childcare sites in our buildings and at our meal sites. Carrie Nicholson will be sharing more information about this here in a bit. Um, another question is, was since we're looking at that one to 15 number, our second through fifth grade remote learning classrooms going to be separated for in-person learning needs. We're not reassigning students and staff for second and fifth grade classrooms at this time. I'll now pass it over to Director of Enrollment and Planning Services, Ashley Davies, to share updates about our return to in-person survey, survey. Thanks for being here, Ashley, appreciate it. You're on mute, Director Davies. Sorry, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Ashley Davies, um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the intent to return to in-person um, uh, learning, a survey that went out to families. So this survey was sent out to all families currently um, enrolled at Seattle Public Schools in pre-K, kindergarten, um, first grade, and those receiving special education um, intensive services um, on Tuesday, January 5th, uh, when we returned back from the break. Um, and it closed um, approximately a week later um, on Wednesday the 13th. Um, and as Superintendent you know mentioned, we had a 70% response rate from that initial survey. Currently, um, school leaders are reaching out to families who have um, not responded to the survey to get a response from each and every student. Um, and tomorrow, those responses are due back to district staff so we can continue to analyze those results and make any additional outreach for students who have not yet um, been accounted for in their response. Um, again, um, it is our intent to get a yes or no response from every student um, rather than continuing to move forward with any planning without hearing back from students. Um, so we understand that the timeline um, was quick and is challenging to get um, information to all of our families um, which is why we have been utilizing several different approaches to outreach to families. If you um, or anyone um, has a family who has not been contacted, um, know that we still have an additional day where school leaders may be reaching out. Otherwise, families can reach out directly to um, their school leader um, and provide their response um, in terms of whether they intend um, to return in person if they fall within the grades um, that are returning. Based on our feedback, um, we also heard from families, what if um, I change my mind um, before school starts? So we are working on an appeal process and more information around that appeal process will be available in the coming days. 
We'll make sure that information um, is available through all of our channels, as well as updated on the FAQ that um, holds several um, pieces of information around um, the return to um, school. And with that, I will pass it on um, to Carrie. Thank you, Director Davies. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that health and safety is at the forefront of everyone's mind, and it should be. This pandemic has impacted the way we live our lives, and it's required each one of us to think differently and to do differently. And while we've learned a lot about the virus over this past year, we recognize that our understanding of COVID-19 is going to continue to evolve. And as it does, we must remain flexible to adjust along with this new knowledge. So during this brief time, I want to share a few significant changes as it relates to the health and safety planning for returning the next phase of students to in-person learning. As you may know, the Department of Health has issued updated guidance for schools on December 16th. So these documents, K-12 Schools 2021 Guidance and K-12 Metrics and Toolkit provides districts with guidance for how and when to resume school in person. The most significant change in these documents is the metrics that are used to help inform decisions about the provision of in-person learning based on COVID disease transmission in the community. So, so while the metrics that are used to guide decision-making have evolved, what hasn't changed is the recommendations for the health and the safety measures to mitigate transmission in the school setting. Seattle Public Schools health and safety protocols and procedures reflect the recommendations set forth by the Department of Health and Public Health Seattle and King County. School nurses help develop staff trainings and staff have demonstrated a strong commitment to upholding these protocols, which include, but are not limited to things like daily health screening, wearing face coverings, physical distancing, hand washing and cleaning and disinfecting. The successful implementation of the health and safety protocols is evidenced by the lack of widespread transmission of COVID-19 within our district. The isolated cases of infection that we have seen are merely a reflection of what we would expect given the high level of community transmission. When cases do arise, we have a contact tracing system which has been in place since last spring and has evolved to include a centralized communication process as well as a dedicated team of experienced school nurses who perform contact tracing in partnership with public health. A critical component of the health and safety protocols is the requirement for students and staff to complete a daily health screening, also known as attestation. Currently, attestations are predominantly done using a QR code or a link. However, a more robust system is necessary to support a district of our size. So therefore, we've contracted with the company Qualtrics to customize the digital attestation platform that students and staff will use to complete the required health screenings. We meet daily in preparation for launching a pilot of this program that's set to occur later at the end of this month. So with that, this concludes a summary of the significant changes that impact health and safety screening or plan, I'm sorry, health and safety planning. But as I conclude, I want to thank the committed staff who've helped develop the health and safety trainings and all the staff who uphold these protocols every single day with the understanding that what I do matters, what you do matters, what we do together matters, our way forward is together. And with that, I will pass it over to Chief Jesse. Thank you, Director Nicholson. So our goal is to have in-person services for students who qualify for pre-K K and one uh, educational services uh, at our 70 elementary and K-8 sites, as well as special education services, including our intensive pathways. So we're planning back from the March 1 uh, date, uh, and we have a number of operational 
uh, plans in place. You got to hear from directors Davies and as well as Nicholson about the key elements. So the survey data will come in uh, around what families uh, wish for for their students, whether that's to remain in remote learning or to participate in in-person services. We will couple that with our current staff survey to determine which staff are coming back or are able to come back uh, to provide in-person services again at pre-K, kindergarten, and first grades. So we'll match those uh, up knowing how many students we have, recognizing that we ha can only have a maximum number of 15 students operating in a cohort bubble to help maintain social distancing um, as well as uh, locking down the separation of groups of students and in the event as director nicholson was mentioning that we had a confirmed positive case that way we only have to uh, do case tracking uh, related to the cohort uh, bubbles that we would have in place um, and we would not have to shut down all a whole campus um, in the event that there was one um, so once we're able to match them up, students come back. We'll uh, also be setting that up in the classrooms. The classrooms will have uh, the desks uh, separated by six feet or more uh, with clear pathways. And then how the day navigates uh, for our students uh, when they come on site, uh, making sure social distance, um, as well as, uh, as when appropriate, wearing masks, um, and then transition periods so that again, uh, students don't come in contact with other classes or cohorts uh, to keep that separation and then exiting the school day. Uh, the last piece would just be a common question that we get from families is why not grades uh, second all the way through uh, 12th and that is because we are actually um, taking staff who are non-classroom teachers um, at other through the elementary grades who are eligible by certification to teach pre-K, kindergarten, and first grades. Uh, so that excess staff can come in, help us support these smaller class sizes, because um, we usually have class sizes that are greater than 15 uh, prior to COVID-19. Um, and then there's no more excess teachers to help fill in for uh, second through fifth grade. And then on the secondary level, um, because of um, the six or seven period day with different teachers across the school day, um, we wouldn't be able to maintain the cohort uh, bubbles that we know that help uh, prevent or mitigate against the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, so those are the um, reasons that we would have um, that uh, set up uh, for us to remain in remote learning for uh, second through 12th. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Superintendent Janot um, for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody for um, all that information. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for all of us being on here. Um, we have a few questions that came in and um, I know we talked a little bit about this last week. And so if you didn't tune in last week, you should actually go back and watch the um, Facebook Live from last week because there was a lot of good information in there as well, particularly around like the physical spaces, HVAC and all that. So, um, but Chief Jesse, you might want to just speak again um, really quickly about um, our HVAC systems, the kind the ventilation kind of process that we've been through. Um, and then also there's a question about how, how are we using portables and if we are will there be sinks in them so just talk a little bit about the physical stuff we uh, the physical buildings that we've been through yeah sure no problem so uh, the we are going through all uh, 70 campuses um, we have been doing that since last spring um, the hvac systems are really critical so when you're looking at how the airflow is for a confined space so you have cubic feet of space and how much air you're able to uh, circulate in that defined space also helps us determine the capacity uh, that we can have as far as the number of students. Um, if there's additional airflow required or necessary, um, those are the things that we can, we can look at um, to help 
increase uh, the um, safety or again, decrease the mitigation for defined spaces that we have. Um, and then uh, also just really critical to that is just the, again, the layout of the classroom, uh, again, maintaining the distances uh, between students um, throughout the entire academic day. Um, and then I think the last piece uh, that you were asking about again was which which part? I'm sorry. Uh, portables. Oh, portable portables, and sinks. Uh, so uh, that's uh, when I was uh, alluding to how transitions happen throughout the school day. We know that on a number of our campuses, we do not have sinks inside the classrooms. In some, we do, and so uh, the whole day is literally mapped out minute by minute so that again the cohort bubbles can transition to bathrooms um, to wash hands uh, sanitation is really critical of course we'll have hand sanitizer uh, as part of the availability in all of our classrooms as well again to help with sanitization and i would be remiss if i didn't mention that we will be cleaning common spaces uh three or areas that would be touched um, three times uh, through the day and then the classrooms are clean on a daily basis uh, to help that so uh, portables are part of that uh, same process as it would be as if they were a classroom inside of the main building. Great and I know that well there's a question that came in and you know I know we're all super excited about our new partnership with Swedish and the potential to get our staff vaccinated in an orderly and coherent manner um, which would be great um, and the question is basically if um, if our if our educators and our school based staff are able to get vaccinated, do we maintain the one to 15 ratio and what might be some other considerations that we take into um, into our decision making? I think Director Nicholson, why don't you go ahead and take that question? Yeah, thank you. So we're um, committed to following the guidance from DOH and our um, public health officials. And so until that changes, we would continue to follow the guidance. While the vaccine is um, a scientific miracle and, and grateful for um, for the expediency of, of, of making a vaccine and, and getting it um, readily available and into the arms, we don't know enough about the virus yet to know about um, transmission even after getting the vaccine. So we will continue to follow and adhere to the guidelines from the Department of Health and um, our local health officials. Yep. So we will continue as we have throughout this entire process to follow public health guidance and to continue to work with our partners in those um, offices and agencies and super appreciative of all the work that's gone on. I've been in a lot of regional meetings that where um, our public health officials are present and really talking to school superintendents across the state to just make sure that we're all informed on things that are going on. Um, anybody can talk about any PPE that's been currently put into place with our staff in schools and how that might continue and our plan for that. I can speak to that briefly. Um, so we, um, for staff, we follow the LNI guidance um, and all the PPE that staff have needed. It's mostly based around what your task or your performance is. So LNI also evolved with some guidance that was put out a few months ago. So um, the PPE is matched to um, the guidance and, and basically it's around what that task is being performed, what the task that employee is doing. So currently staff who are serving students, those few and in person right now, have been supplied PPE based on proximity and duration of time and so forth. So um, just in short, it really is following the guidance of LNI, which we're required to do and will continue to do. Thanks. And as far as like scheduling, uh, we said, you know, we're getting down to the minute by minute kind of scheduling. Can you talk a little bit about how lunches will be handled and recess and all those other things that students are used to having when they're in person? Yeah, and I, I think you're speaking to the commitment we have for our youngest students. I, I would want to really capture that um, our young students who are, you know, ages three through seven, um, you know, you have students who are social social learners. Uh, and so that's the benefit of in-person services. Social emotional learning is significantly uh, important for them as well as Seattle Public Schools. And so when we're uh, bringing the students on site, um, 
we know that there will be needs to um, give something to get something. Uh, lunches uh, is one of those. Uh, students, I know that's a great time uh, for students to socialize. So they'll be able to do that inside their classrooms. So the meals will be served inside the classrooms. Um, and then recess, uh, which is also a critical component of social skills, will continue to take place. So students will go out uh, utilizing um, any of the playground equipment or, of course, uh, area, defined areas on uh, each school's campus. Uh, and then, um, as I was mentioning, the minute by minute that you were also uh, highlighting is just knowing which class is out there, who has that uh, scheduled time to be um, uh, uh, outside and then coming back inside. And then you're rotating through the different classrooms of course, uh, again, pre-K, K-1, uh, recognizing that the kindergartner, uh, pre-K uh, students usually use different size of equipment than our K-1s. So there you go. Thanks. And Director Davies, there's a question about, there's a little bit of confusion because all these enrollments and intent to enrollment things are happening with our kindergarten for next year. Can you just explain a little bit about kind of what the parallel tracks are right now as far as what we're asking families to sign up for? Certainly. So we did begin um, new registration for students for the 21-22 school year um, on January 4th, um, but the intent to return to in-person learning is for this current school year, beginning March 1st, for again students who are in um, pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, um, and who require intensive special education services. So um, if you are a new student to the district or if you have an incoming kindergarten student and you're interested in enrolling in Seattle Public Schools for fall of 2021, you are still able to do that um, through our um, uh, annual um, new student registration process. Yeah, thanks. And there was one follow-up question about, are we accommodating for a potential increase in kindergartners next year? So um, we do have a, um, a few different ways that we are looking at um, how our incoming kindergarten um, student population may be impacted by um, this current school year um, and our options for next school year. So at this point, we do anticipate that there will be um, an increase in kindergarten students um, outside of a typical school year. So we are planning for that. Great news. Um, I, one final question, I guess, is we know that this pandemic and remote learning has been really hard on the mental and emotional um, parts of all of us, both as adults and students. And what types of support are we putting in place for the emotional needs of students um, and teachers um, for next year? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Um, uh, the importance was like our strong start. I think. Um, one of our best moves was um, dedicating time for our staff and our students to build relationships. Yes, I, I know it was through this video conference or electronically, which is not ideal for most people that I know, um, staff or students or families, um, but that time is just to get to know one another. And then we built that into the schedule that we have dedicated time each week um, if not daily uh, for families and students and teachers to communicate uh, through either email or, or of course video conferencing that we have so that we have more dedicated one-on-one -on -one or small group time. Uh, the social emotional learning, we built a ton, tens, uh, almost, uh, gosh, at least 30 lessons now uh, for each of the grade levels for social emotional learning that teachers can lift off um, and so that's been um, extremely popular with our teachers. Um, that started actually this past summer uh, for our learners. We had 15,000 students come online. That's incredible. Um, and so we're gonna continue to support those moves. And then for the staff, um, I think Director Nicholson was mentioning that, you know, we're in this together. Um, we've been doing outreach for our staff. We know that relationships matter. We've had a campaign that was kicked off by uh, Superintendent Janot that says, hey, just find somebody and reach out, right? Making connection and checking in to see just how are you doing? And you don't need to talk about work, it's just seeing how people are personally doing. 
And then ongoing uh, check-ins by someone that you have a relationship with um, is really important uh, because that way um, you have an ability to express. It's really difficult sometimes to uh, express where you're at social emotionally um, when uh, you're in, uh, perhaps isolated. And then my last part is we've had some group opportunities that we've had and contracted with uh, both internal and ex external con uh, counselors uh, for some small groups of uh, employees want to participate in that. So thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. So it's going to be super important as we continue this work. And I mean, it's been important throughout the whole thing, but it's going to be super important, especially as we look forward. Um, I just really appreciate all of you for being here. Um, thanks so much. As we all know, there are no easy decisions in this and there aren't, um, you know, any any direction that we go is, is there's going to be frustration. And so we understand that um, and, you know, we keep pushing forward because we know that in person is going to be great for our youngest learners. But just want to thank you for joining us today. If we weren't able to get to your question today, we'll work to respond in the comments. We'll be hosting these virtual town halls more regularly leading up to our increase in in-person instruction on March 1st. So please join us on January 26th for our next town hall to get the latest on outdoor and community education updates. And we hope to see you then. Thanks so much.